so when one turns 70, one is allowed to forget some things. But I want to ask you, Franco, what you did on March 16, 1976, that was about that time when the photograph was taken. I learned from Professor Arima. Probably you don't know, but... <coughs> yes, you invented the IBM II. Because I have taken a Xerox copy of Franco Iacchino's logbook, and that said on March 16, he has written down photons, and there's an S, the photons are neutrons, an S boson and a D boson. And then further down the same page, I mean, he comes up with the algebraic solution, uh, one times one representation, then you have the two times uh, mixed symmetric representation. So you here have the, so for two bosons, the vibrational picture, zero plus ground state, first two plus one phonon state, and then the two phonon triplet, and then the new feature for this coupled system is that there appear these mixed symmetric states with a one phonon two plus state and then a one plus and three plus two phonon state made out of two D bosons. And uh, of course we published that together with the collaborators, Akita Lima and Taka Otsuka, who have lost the age over the time and uh, Nikai Tati and to come here. So my outline is I will discuss uh, some of these features of the IBM II and show the inspiration that this model uh, gives to the experimentalists, but also the challenges that it poses. So I will start with reminding uh, those of you that are not so familiar with the model and the basic features, and this just this, this figure, then I discuss a few ma historical milestones, like the discovery of the scissors phones and the vibration activity states and the experimental things. And then I will focus in the last uh, 15 minutes on some recent uh, developments that uh, we can do. So this is again a little bit more fancy, the drawing from Franco's logbook. So here you see also the boson wave function. For this example, one boson, boson, one neutron boson. You have this symmetric one phonon and two phonon states. And then these symmetric states where you can think of the fundamental one quadrupole phonon mixed symmetry state. So as this, uh, uh, yeah, as the one phonon state, and that one with the minus sign between the proton and the neutron uh, components. And then two boson states on top of that. Uh, therefore, two bosons, you have one plus and three plus. And if you have more bosons, you have the full quintuplet, zero plus and three. And of course, I mean, these states are sensitive to the boson neutron interactions in the, in the valence shape. So this again uh, is the vibrator scheme, but of course you can change the parameters in the IBM Hamiltonian, and then you can have, for instance, a rotor that is again for two bosons. And then these levels arrange themselves in a different way. Now you have rotational bands, and here you have this one plus two plus three plus states that form the beginning of the scissors mode. And now you see already the difference. So the the signature for these mixed symmetric states, they are sort of isovector states. The signature is the existence of strong magnetic dipole transitions. And in the rotor, there is this M1 that goes directly to the ground state. So when you populate these states from the ground state, that means the signature of that mixed symmetry state is identical to the excitation time. So it's easier to detect that. So you do, for instance, electron scattering or photon scattering. You see the states then you know by exciting them, you have the signature measured directly. Now, for this multiphonal mixed symmetry states, the situation is a little bit more difficult. You have to excite them somehow from the ground state, but then their signature is M1 decays to excited states. So now, signature and excitation path are decoupled, and you have to work a little bit more harder. So, therefore, historically, the scissors mode was the first mixed symmetry state that was uh, discovered. And the discoverer is also sitting in the audience. I think Richter did that piece of work in 1983. He called it the first time, the first publication was 84. So here is the electron scattering that he has done on the Darlinak in Darmstadt on the Ludwig Gardelini 156. And then later on, there were photon scattering experiments done in Darmstadt and in Stuttgart uh, mostly. And uh, then a couple of years later, uh, the uh, discussion about whether or not this is a collective mode 
uh, I mean, it was over because the data that uh, have been taken until that time, I mean, in this Dar Stuttgart, Darmstadt, Cologne collaboration clearly proved the collectivity of these facilities. <coughs> So, uh, what about these uh, vibrational structures? So here you see again uh, the signatures, so from the one corner and from the two corner, states you are expecting strong N1 transitions to those symmetric states with the same number of phonons. So one phonon goes to one phonon, two phonon, two phonon. And that is what we found after a couple of years of work on this uh, magic nucleus of on this uh, funny nucleus, a uh, very interesting nucleus, molecular 94, uh, where all of these patterns are very clearly seen. So the blue transitions indicate the magnetic dipole transitions, and the blue numbers are the M1 matrix elements, the nuclear magneton. So they are all of the order of one nuclear magneton, so strong in compared to other uh, M1 transitions between low lying states. So that was a clear proof for the existence of this full pattern of, uh, of multiphonon structure in the mixed symmetry sector. What did we do to prove this? What you have to do is to measure all the magnetic dipole strength between excited states and do an M1 strength distribution. So we had to measure for all the two plus states that are shown here on the top the Vm1 uh, strength value to the first two plus states. And when you plot all this, you see that one of the two plus it has a large M1, and that is the one for the mixed symmetry state. You can also look at the, at the E2 excitation strength from the ground, and then you see that this one for the state is the next two largest collective E2 excitation that looks with the first two plus, of course, the most collective. Uh, so here you see the signature for the one for the mixed symmetry state. You also want to know the two for the mixed symmetry state. Then you have to do the same one phonon multiple higher. So now you have to look, for instance, in the M1 uh, distribution from the second two plus state, the two phonon state, to all the one pluses, to all two pluses, to all three pluses, and find where you have large M1 strength. And that is what we have done. And you see all these M1 strength concentrate at around 3 MV here, and it's all on the same uh, scale. But I must warn you, I mean, this you cannot do often. That was five years of work to once prove that this prediction of the IBM 2 is, is right. What we have to do is to pull out of our toolbox all the tools that we have. I mean, we have done photon scattering experiments, gamma ray coincidence spectroscopy for the matter decay, light ion fusion experiment, neutron scattering, and measure all excitation energies for these two plus states, all the spin parity quantum numbers, lifetimes, branching ratios, E2 to M1 multiple mixing ratios, in order to be able to plot these, these uh, distributions. So clearly, for doing a systematic study, you have to find another tool uh, to study this more efficiently. And then in, at Yale, I, mean, I did the first at the Gale Tunde, with Rodinium 96, we found that the inverse kinematic Coulomb excitation is an ideal tool to study the one phonon mixed symmetry states uh, in, in heavy nuclei. Uh, so by uh, projectile Coulomb excitation. So what you what you do there is you scatter on a light target like carbon, which is very easy to get, you scatter a, a beam of the nucleus you want to investigate. And then you excite all the excited two plus states uh, by according to the E2 excitation strength. And then you measure with an efficient uh, gamma ray detector all the decay branches uh, from angular distribution to get spin quantum numbers, multipolarities from the cross sections to get the, then the lifetimes. And since you have the uh, decay branches and the multipolarities, you get then the transition strength distributions. And then after the pioneering experiment at the Yale tandem, we proposed that to uh, the Argonne National Lab to do a, a similar experiment at Gamma Sphere. Now on this nucleus, cerium-138. And uh, here's something that should encourage the younger experimentalists. Be not discouraged if the 
uh, PAC would not uh, allow your experiment. So the PAC said, well, we wanted to do this in, in single experiments, of course. So we wanted to switch off all the coincidence triggers at gamma sphere, and that was unheard of because gamma sphere was the ultimate gamma, gamma, gamma coincidence experiment. And the PAC said it wouldn't work. And then I'm very grateful to Robert Janssens. He realized that that was a good idea, and he said, no, but you can have 12 hours of leave time, and you can do that experiment. So we shot then uh, Cerium 138 on the carbon target, and then finally we got 15 hours of leave time, and then we observed the first six two plus days up to an energy of 2.7 MeV, and uh, Kulex inverse kinematics on the carbon target is very clean because you do not have any other, you don't have any reactions that you can do in single measurement. And from, from this uh, uh, spectrum that we get, I mean, with billions of counts, we hear the first to plus, there is a couple of million counts per channel. I mean, we have a huge count rate. And then very quickly, you can measure the strength distribution, and here we find the two plus infinity state, which we obtained from the strength distribution. So that was the case series 138. So that was the strongest M1 uh, excitation. Then we measured also on the barium isotopic chain, the xenon isotopic chain, and for the completeness, I also plotted some literature values that were from different experiments in the new region. But here I'm not so certain about them. They are not <coughs> So this tool was now like a very like, a, like a, a factory I mean, for these sort of experiments. So in a, a few experiments, we could map out all the strength distributions in this uh, stable nuclei at the mass uh, 130 degrees. And then when you, do, when you have systematic data, you can do systematic. So the first question you ask is, how do these structures evolve as a function of particle number, as a function of protons or neutrons? So you see, in the N equals 80 isotonic chain, the energy of the first to plus state increases with the photon number. The same happens in the cerium isotopic chain. And then in the N equals 7, no, in, that is in the N equals 78 chain. In the N equals 76, it behaves differently. And also you know, you notice that the M1 strength decreases when we go inside the shell. We don't understand that. That's a, that's a puzzle. In the isotopic chains, you see a decrease when you go inside the shell. In barium, you see also a decrease in energy and also in strength when you go inside the shell. In xenons, you see an increase of the energy when you go inside the shell, but also a decrease in strength. Not understood for the moment. So, uh, <coughs> Here was one piece missing, that is tellurium-130, that is a radioactive nucleus. So we did these measurements at Argon, so we had stable beams at our disposal. Uh, but uh, this is projectile Coulomb excitation, so it could be done also on a radioactive beam. And this was done for the first time on the tellurium-132 a uh, nucleus that was the strongest radioactive beam at Oak Ridge. And when we looked at the data that were taken by Nick Stone for measurement of the G factor, we actually found that the 2 plus 6 symmetry state was in there. So there was, from the literature, a 2 plus state known that matched very strongly to the second 2 plus. And you can explain that only if that is M1, otherwise it would be an outrageously large E2 of super deformed. So we saw that transition here between these two pluses, and the M1 must be at least 0.2 mu n squared. So there's, this is for sure also the, the symmetry state there. And then you see the evolution of the energy now, including this radioactive blue 132, and that is the first example where mixed symmetry state has been seen in a radioactive nucleus on the basis of absolute M1. So then came up a new question also from the systematic start to see when we go inside the inside the, 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 the shell, we see 
branches coming from the mixility state also to the second two cluster, which should not be so in the vibrational pattern. Uh, and we haven't understood yet this yet uh, quantitatively. So, how much time do I have? You have seven minutes. Okay. Good. So, this was gamma ray spectroscopy, heavy ion reactions. Now, I want to come to a second subject that uh, we have started recently at the SLAMLAC to study this mixility state also in electron scattering. And, uh, in order to access the relative phase for protons and neutrons, uh, we combine this with proton scattering experiments in order to disentangle uh, the thing. So what you see here on the top is the electron scattering data taken at the Asalina, together with Achim and Peter von Norman Kohl, the students. And the first feature you observe is the here's the elastic line that is the red part of the and then there are three strong peaks and then at higher energy up to four, and then you see a lot of two plus states. But the strong peaks are the one phonon states, the first two plus, the one quadruple phonon state, the first three minus, the one optical phonon state, and the mixility state, which is the third two plus state in that nucleus, is a one phonon state. So therefore, strongly excited in this ultimate relativistic cool of excitation, which is electron scattering. So it excites one step, one phonon. 